DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, presents Spiritual Desolation. Be aware, understand, take action with Father Timothy Gallagher. Father Gallagher is a member of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, a religious community dedicated to retreats and spiritual formation according to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. He is featured on several series found on the Eternal Word television network. He is also author of numerous books on the spiritual teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola and the venerable Bruno Lanteri, founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, all published by the Crossroads Publishing Company. This particular series is based in part on Chapter 4 of Setting Captives Free, Personal Reflections on Ignatian Discernment of Spirits. Spiritual Desolation. Be aware, understand, take action with Father Timothy Gallagher. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. What I'd like to do from this uh, new book um, is look at some further considerations with regard to spiritual desolation. And the first is a question that always comes up, inevitably comes up whenever I present the rules usually in about midpoint in the rules, after we've described spiritual desolation, a hand will be raised and someone will say, well, what about the experience of Mother Teresa, for example? How do we understand that in the light of what Ignatius is saying? Was that spiritual desolation? Was that something different? And sometimes people who have a background in Carmelite spirituality will raise the same question, but in more broad terms now, using the language of St. John of the Cross. St. John of the Cross speaks about the dark night. Is that the same as spiritual desolation? Is it something different than spiritual desolation? If it is different, in what does the difference consist? How do we recognize the one and the other? And what is the appropriate response to the one and the other? So obviously these are important questions, because depending on the answers, we're going to respond to our experience in one way or in another. Now, I'll say here before we go any further that the the guardrail, the safety net in all of this is always conversation with a wise and competent spiritual guide. So that if we have personal questions about especially the dark night, and we're wondering whether something we're experiencing is that dark night, what I'm going to do now is give general considerations about this But in the one-on-one, the ideal always, if we can do it, and I reverence the fact that it's not always easy, that would be obviously the ideal. So to look at this whole issue now uh, in general terms, the key to answering this question about the difference, if there is a difference, between spiritual desolation and and the dark night is to use the terms clearly. So spiritual desolation we don't need to say any more about. We've, that's what we've been doing, heaviness of heart on the level of our relationship with God. The dark night. Now, if we're going to be more specific, John of the Cross speaks about two dark nights, the dark night of sense and the dark night of spirit. And each of these two dark nights has an active and a passive component. So, for example, the dark night of sense, the active component would be the efforts that we make to purify the level of the senses in our humanity so that it becomes receptive, able to receive God. The whole thrust of what John of the Cross is doing uh, after he, he paints this absolutely captivating ideal, especially in the spiritual canticle and the living flame of love, in the other works, The Ascent of Mount Carmel and The Dark Knight, he is describing the pathway toward that Um, all-consuming, ineffably beautiful communion with the Lord, which is love, which is the goal. But there's a path toward it, and he describes that in detail, and the essential uh, element in the path is self-emptying. We spoke about this earlier as making space for God. So finally you get to the nada, you know, where where the human person is completely available to God, and then God can fill us. So the dark night of sense is an experience of prayer, an experience given by God, which is painful because it is purifying the level of the senses in our humanity so that they become empty of whatever 
would make them less receptive to God. And there is an active component. We need to do our own part in this. But in the pie chart, almost all of the pie chart is the passive dark night, which is what God does. So that's the passive uh, dark night of sense. And then something similar after that phase has been experienced. Later on, God may call the person through the dark night of the spirit so that now the spiritual level of the human person becomes emptied in a way that allows it to be completely receptive to God and receive the higher stages of communion with God in infused mystical contemplation. And again, there is an active component, but by far the the major piece in this is God's work, where the person receives this experience of prayer, which is painful because it's too much light for the person. The person is just not able yet to receive it, and a purification is needed in order to be able to receive fully all of the love and communion that God wants to give. So when I speak about the dark night now, what I mean by that primarily is the passive dark night of sense and of of the spirit. Now, having said that, the great difference between the two experiences is immediately evident. Is spiritual desolation different from the dark night? The answer is absolutely and resoundingly yes. They are completely different experiences. The spiritual desolation is a work of the enemy, discouragement on the level of our relationship with God. The dark night is painful, yes, but it is a work of God. It is an experience of prayer, which is always a gift and grace of God. And its purpose is to lead a person to a greater availability, to deeper communion and a deeper bond of love with the Lord, and therefore fruitfulness as well. So, spiritual desolation is a work of the enemy. The only appropriate response to it is to reject it. The dark night is a work of God, and the only appropriate response to that, therefore, is to accept it. And we see that uh, in so many of the saints and the growth that comes from it. In the light of that, we can go back to the experience of St. Teresa of Calcutta. If we read the book which describes her experience, Come Be My Light, it's very clear that her spiritual directors who worked with her understood her prolonged darkness as the classic dark night in John of the Cross's sense. What was different about her experience of the dark night. Not entirely different because there are other examples like this. Uh, For example, St. Paul of the Cross who had a protracted experience of the dark night. But what is uh, special to her experience is the the duration with just a very few interruptions for 50 years in her life. Now, if we read classic spiritual writers like Garagou Lagrange, for example, they discuss this experience of the dark night in some of the saints. That is, that God gives the dark night so that the person will be purified and ready to receive a deeper communion of love with God. In some cases, these writers will say, even after the dark night has accomplished that work, God will permit the dark night to continue in the person because that dark night now becomes redemptive and a source of grace for others. And I think it would be difficult to find a more uh, striking example of that than the life of St. Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa, whose life, in a way that few saints' lives have, touched the entire world and blessed us people beyond counting and continues, obviously, to do that today. So that would be the understanding. Um, St. Teresa of Calcutta experienced the classic dark night And in this understanding of it, it was continued because her life through that became, as she so so often said, something beautiful for God that led so many people to God. Now, there's another thing that we need to say about this issue of spiritual desolation and the dark night. And it's the reason why this issue gets confused at times, because of a very legitimate expanded use of the metaphor, dark night. Dark night is a metaphor. It's a very rich metaphor. And in keeping with the nature of metaphor, it can be applied to a wide variety of experiences. And that's why I said that the the key thing to answer the question about the difference 
between spiritual desolation and the dark night is to see the terms clearly exactly as Ignatius uses the one and John of the Cross uses the other. Having said that, however, many people do use the term dark night in an expanded way. And just some examples of this. In one of her letters in 1955, Flannery O'Connor writes that right now, the whole world seems to be going through a dark night of the soul, which is obviously a, a very different understanding of the metaphor dark night than John of the Cross's specific use of it for a person who, in terms of the dark night of sense, is right now being called by God into the initial stages of infused contemplation and therefore goes through this purifying experience of prayer. What she's referring to is her sense of the weakening of faith and the the harmful tendencies which uh, appear to be growing in the world. And she looks at that and sees that the whole world seems to be undergoing this kind of spiritually dark experience. Dr. Gerald May, in his book Grace and Addiction, speaks about a dark night of recovery in members of AA. So these would be people who through alcohol, have hit rock bottom at a certain point. Their lives have fallen apart. And there's great pain and darkness and heaviness. And out of that is born the urgent need for a change, for a recovery. So he speaks of that experience of the person struggling with alcohol when everything falls apart as a dark night. Legitimate use of the metaphor, but obviously very different from the way that John of the Cross speaks about it. Elsewhere, uh, Dr. May speaks of what he calls a corporate dark night in social systems. So in a culture, in a business, in an academic institution, and so on, family, you could get to a point where there's a heaviness, a darkness that pervades the entire social system and discouragement and uh, anxiety about the future, uh, struggles with present issues. And obviously, again, that's a very legitimate use of the term dark night, but obviously, again, very different from what uh, John of the Cross is describing. And then at the time when the Passion of the Christ uh, came out in one of the interviews that Mel Gibson gave, he described an earlier period of his life when things when he was wild and uh, got into a situation of great emptiness uh, in his life. He described that period in his life as a dark night of the soul. Again, a legitimate use of it. In in terms of my spiritual life, things reached a very dark point and there was an urgent need for a change. But again, obviously very different from what John of the Cross is speaking about. And then finally, to give one more instance of this, this is St. John Paul II, who is speaking to Carmelites. And he says, the term dark night is now used of all of the spiritual life and not just a phase of the spiritual journey in the way that John of the Cross uses it. The saints, that is John of the Cross's doctrine, is now invoked in response to this unfathomable mystery of human suffering. So St. John Paul II extends the use of the term dark night to the entirety of the experience of suffering. And probably many of us um, will resonate with that when we've gone through heavy times in our lives with uh, physical struggles, financial, family matters, work-related matters, church issues. We'll find that that metaphor seems very appropriate to describe what we're experiencing. So again, uh, St. John Paul II, who is a master of John of the Cross, obviously, and knows very well how St. John of the Cross uses the term now expands its use to the whole mystery of suffering in general. So all of those uses of the term dark night are valid, but in order to answer our initial question about the relationship between spiritual desolation and the dark night, we really need to focus specifically on John of the Cross's use of the term. We'll return to Spiritual Desolation. Be aware, understand, take action with Father Timothy Gallagher in just a moment. Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, 
Father Mauritius Fildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages, can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, the Chaplet of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today. The Councils of Mercy, an excerpt from the writings of Venerable Bruno Lanteri, founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. Above all, I recommend with all my heart that you guard against discouragement, disturbance, and sadness. Seek always to keep your poor heart in peace and encourage it, and always to serve God with holy joy. Be of good heart, because the Lord is with you, and he loves you. For more excerpts from the writings of Venerable Bruno Lanteri, visit discerninghearts.com. We now return to Spiritual Desolation. Be aware, understand, take action with Father Timothy Gallagher. It's so interesting as you were going through those different comparisons that from Flannery O'Connor all the way to St. John Paul, that the emphasis on the darkness, the, the heaviness, was coming forward. But as you described earlier, and if, in reading John of the Cross, it, you said that sometimes you get so close to the light, maybe you get blinded by it. And all I could think of is when you, first thing in the morning, I'm in a room and it's all darkness. My eyes have been shut and and my husband comes along <laughs> very early in the morning, turns on all the lights in the room. Initially, it's like you have to cover your eyes because you just can't stand all that light. But if I'm going to get up and maneuver in that room, I, it, my eyes have to take time to adjust because otherwise... While I walk through there, I could be stepping and bumping into things and knocking into things. And, and gradually it, it becomes clearer and clearer. And now, okay, now I can see. That, that's a, a difference between a, a light that has been brought into a scene that helps me in the end as opposed to a, a desolation, you know, that attack, essentially, of the enemy. It's a very good analogy. Uh, it's very evident because we, we all know that experience. So it's not darkness, but the excess of light that causes the the struggle. Or in terms of the, the dark night in John of the Cross, this sense, the painful quality. Because we raised that, let's uh, just look at a couple authors. So, of the first dark night, that of sense, one classic author, this is Augustin Poulain, his, his classic book, The Graces of in Interior Prayer, writes that it is the dark night, a prayer of simplicity, characterized by a state of aridity, generally experienced as bitter and painful. So, it's prayer. It's a very simplified prayer. Uh, there's an arid quality about it. And the person experiences it as bitter and painful. So to stay with the analogy, what's happening on the spiritual level is like the sudden overexposure to light. It's, it's painful, not because it's darkness, but because it's just too much and the person is not yet emptied enough to, to receive it. That's the whole point of the dark night. And then uh, Father Thomas Dubay writes this. Why are the passive nights painful? Good question. This purification process is a cure of illness and therefore involves a cutting away, a removal of the roots of spiritual maladies and a separation from the egocentricism that wounds us. In these beginnings of infused prayer, so that's exactly where the dark night of sense comes when God is now beginning to call the person out of the more active ways of meditating or lexio, 
uh, or, or whatever into the more receptive mode. You know, I'm going to interrupt the, the quote here to say this, that one way I think that we can at least glimpse what we're talking about when we speak of infused contemplative prayer is an experience that we've probably all had at times when maybe we're praying the rosary, saying the liturgy of the hours, meditating on scripture, engaged in lexio, other forms of prayer. And at a certain point, we find ourselves now not wanting to say the next prayer or to continue reading in the scripture, but just to let that be and just let our heart be quieted and be with God. And we know that that not saying prayers or not reading is not just emptiness or distraction, but it's letting those go because of a fullness, because of a communion. And we rightly treasure such experiences. With reverence, if I may approach them, those are distant initial glimpses of what can happen when a person's prayer becomes entirely this, becomes entirely receptive, and the communion with the Lord becomes rich and deep and beautiful and transforms the person. So the dark nights have their place because they prepare the person for that kind of prayer and that kind of communion and the enormous fruitfulness that they bring. Along these lines, let me quote a line from St. John of the Cross. This is a line that St. Therese loved and quoted often. The smallest movement of pure love, of this kind, the kind that we're describing, the smallest movement of pure love is more useful to the church than all other works put together. The smallest movement of pure love is more useful to the church than all other works put together. And it's out of this that St. Therese understands that her vocation is exactly that, to be love in the church. So that the more we are faithful to our life of prayer, in, in God's providence and in God's timing, prayer grows. We are bringing into our families, our marriages, our parishes, our workplace, our world, something that is of greater value to the church than all other works put together. And that is, having received love from God, we are able then to respond in love to God and out of that to love others. Uh, Therese's life, of course, would be but certainly an outstanding example. All she did was love. And in very small things. And she has been called by the popes the greatest saint of modern times. And the benefit, the, the beneficial effects of her life and writings are obvious. So that's just to say that there's a reason why God would call a person through the dark night. So to continue with the quotation from uh, Father Dubé about why the, the passive nights are painful, this is a cutting away, a removal of the roots of spiritual maladies and a separation from the egocentricism that wounds us so that we become increasingly more selfless and more able to receive God's love and therefore to share it. He continues, In these beginnings of infused prayer, God is communicating nothing less than himself through a light and love that itself consumes our egocentricism. We do not, however, perceive this communication as light and love, but as darkness and pain. This perception, and this is the reason why the dark night, which is an excess, as it were, of light and love, why it's painful, this perception is due to our incapacity and opaqueness and unlikeness to the divine. Hence, in this night, one perceives the love he is receiving as dryness and emptiness. And then gradually, as the person goes faithfully through this, the person is transformed, becomes more capable of receiving that love, and the, the painful quality subsides, and a whole new depth of love and communion with the Lord uh, enters into the person's life. So that's to go back to your analogy, that's just in one author, I think a very nice description of why the, the dark night has that effect. It's, it's dark not because of the kind of discouraging darkness the enemy brings, but because we need to be prepared to receive the fullness of the light and love that God wants to give. You know, I think it's a good thing for us to discuss this, even if we can't say that we've experienced that in our own experience, but it's a good thing for us just to even reflect on what prayer can become when the human heart is open to it. 
because it shows us that there is so much more. That's what reading the saints does, like Therese that I just mentioned, or John of the Cross, or so many others. They reveal to us th- th- what can be, and therefore encourage us to continue on the journey. Every year on the Feast of All Saints in the Liturgy of the Hours, the Church has us read in the Office of Readings a, a selection from St. Bernard where he talks about just reflecting on the saints. And he says, For myself, I will tell you that when I think of the saints, I feel myself filled with a great longing. And that's what it does. Uh, I've, I find that uh, since we've raised uh, St. John of the Cross, that's what he does for me. He's There is so much truth in his writing that you feel like a pouring faucet and all you have is a little glass, you know. But what he does has this effect, the ascent of Mount Carmel, and and from the humble place where we see ourselves in the spiritual life. We look up and there is the high mountain of what holiness can become. And what it does is to undo the limits that we so easily set on ourselves and show us that there's so much more. And what it does is to awaken a desire for more. It's the difference between feeling a little bit unhappily that we have to accept where things are and seeing with hope that so much more lies ahead. And then it has the effect that St. Bernard describes, that when I think of the saints, I feel myself filled with a great longing, with a great desire. And desire is the beginning of the journey, and it's the beginning of growth on the journey. It's one of the things that St. Therese also says, is that she experienced over and over in her life that God never gave her a desire, except that he meant to fulfill that desire. How much do do we desire in the spiritual life? How much do we dare to hope for? So approaching a saint like uh, St. John of the Cross has that wonderful effect. Even though, personally, I'll just say of myself, I feel pretty small, (laughs) you know, when I see uh, a man like this. But what it does do is it tells me that um, the Lord has so much more in store if I'm willing to stay on the journey. You've been listening to Spiritual Desolation. Be aware, understand, take action with Father Timothy Gallagher. This particular series is based in part on Chapter 4 of Setting Captives Free, Personal Reflections on Ignatian Discernment of Spirits. You can find this book on Father Gallagher's website at fathertimothygallagher.org. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Spiritual Desolation. Be aware, understand, and take action with Father Timothy Gallagher.